Hi, everybody. It's Kevin Raber, and we're back for another Conversations With. And today is my guest. I have Jan Bell. And Jan's a, a really interesting photographer. His work is exceptional. Um, I stumbled upon him in Chicago a few years ago when I was with Art Wolf. He was at an art fair there. And uh, we enjoyed not only speaking with him, but our relationship has kind of evolved since then. I follow him closely on social media. Um, he's got an amazing eye, uh, a great style for his photography. He's got a couple things going. I mean, he, he doesn't sit still. And uh, as you will hear through this uh, interview, it's astounding with some of the challenges that he has that he pushes through and does all the things uh, that he does. So Jan, welcome. It's nice to see you. And thank you for being part of PXL here. Well, I appreciate it, Kevin. It's always good talking with you also. Good. Well, you know, you, you specialize pretty much in black and white photography, correct? Right. How did you get interested in photography? Um, and specifically along the way, how did you, did you develop the style that you have? The interest started early on in my childhood, um, just playing around with a family camera. And moving fast forwarding to college, um, I took a few photography courses. And I remember being in the darkroom the first time. And we've all heard the story a million times, but when I saw the print and, you know, developing in the tray, a developer, oh, yeah. it was just so magical. Oh. Like I was hooked at that point. So my, 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 um, my major was graphic design, but I took a lot of photo classes. Upon graduating, a friend told me about an opening at a photo studio in Toledo, Ohio, and I nabbed that. So for three or four years, um, I worked alongside some really good photographers who were doing work for uh, major corporations like Dana, uh, Champion Spark Plug, LOF, Owens Corning, OI. So I learned a lot about uh, product photography. And during that time, I did a lot of shooting because film was free but we won't tell anyone that uh, film and developing was free. So I, I was doing a lot of shooting. Um, from there, I was hired as an art director at PBS and I spent 32 years doing that job. So I think that period of time really honed my skills as a graphic artist and specifically dealing with composition. And I attribute that to the, um, the compositions that I do today. Well, your, your compositions are very, very unique. Now, first off, you pretty much work in an all square format, correct? Correct, yes. It's interesting, going back, my work was color in the beginning of this 20 year period um, that I've been serious about photography, where I've been doing my work um, under the, the business name of Bell Images. So, um, the, the early work starting around the year 2000 was mainly uh, color succulent photos. So it, there's one section in my website where I still um, show those. They're not the emphasis of my work any longer, but they're kind of a bread and butter thing. Um, people like to decorate with them. So I've kept them on my website. Uh, the work transitioned to black and white about 10 years ago, 12 years ago when I took a workshop at the Ansel Adams Center with Charlie Kramer. And it was incredible. I mean, without that, I don't think I would be where I'm at today. But I did a lot more studying of black and white and looking at black and white and converting my work to black and white. And with black and white, I didn't have the hassles that I have with printing color. So it just seems to be a win-win. Well, you know, you can't beat Charlie Kramer as an instructor. I mean. But he's such a calm and nice guy, and uh, his photography just comes so natural, and he's got such a good eye for for seeing and so forth. So, and when it comes to printing, um, you know, he's he's very picky. So, I've learned a lot from him also. Although, you know, I do color and everything else like that. I find it a challenge when I look at your your beautiful photographs. There are interesting, beautiful things that are around us. I tend to shoot a lot, so. I have a very hard time. While I might see what you're shooting, I'm also going to be looking to my left and right and seeing things to shoot. And I kind of go completely crazy. Um, you seem to have the ability to 
you know, see uh, an image and focus on that image. And with long exposure and a lot of other things, they're able to make something that if somebody lined up a slew of prints on a wall and said, okay, can you pick Jan's pictures out? I could go to every one of them and pick them out. And I think that's a testament to a, a photographer when they have a style that is recognizable and a discipline that comes through in all their images. What a compliment. Um... That's why we're talking. I've often wondered whether I have a style, and I've talked with a couple people about it, because uh, there are times I shoot buildings, there are times I shoot landscapes, there are times that I shoot only botanicals. And in my mind, I wonder how those all go together. And a couple people have told me they, they go together beautifully because they all have that same simplistic uh, feel and um, a narrowing in of one's focus. Um, you mentioned when you, sh when you shoot, you're looking left and right and up and down and all around. And I used to be that way. Shoot, 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 shoot. And um, I would come home with so many photos and found it to be just a pain to go through all those. So there was a slow evolution to shooting less. And I remember hiring a guide uh, a few years ago to go to White Pocket and um, areas throughout South, South Coyote Buttes. And this person was uh, very introspective, very quiet. But when he said something, it's, it, it really was like, wow. So it was interesting to hear him say that I shoot very differently than almost anyone he's ever taken out. So uh, I spent a lot of time looking. I spent a lot of time scouting. And being retired from my uh, career at PBS as the, as the design director, it gives me the luxury to spend however much time I really need to spend. And I feel that's necessary to, to gain a, a feel of the subject matter that I'm immersed in. So I, I think that really helps. Um, and I do a lot of uh, test shots with my iPhone. I find it, um, um, I forget the word I need, um, indispensable. Uh, because I can come back at night and look through those photos. I can see them um, as quick black and whites if I want to do so. And even though the conversations may be minutely different, they are different. So it helps me to gain an insight as to what um, image that I want to go back and seriously photograph. The bite is when I can't find that specific spot, you know, <laughs> because a lot of my images come from areas where there's like volcanic activity and rock and it all begins to look very similar. Before you actually shoot the picture, you said you go scout it out. It's interesting you bring that up. And I don't know if this is the same that you do, but I have an app on my uh, iPhone called Viewfinder. And um, I'm doing uh, and shooting a lot with uh, the Phase 1 XT system right now on several lenses. And uh, it's a beautiful camera, but it's not like a snapshot camera. And, you know, that you can carry around your neck. And so if, what I'm finding is I've been driving around the Indianapolis area and some places, and I'm, I use this app called Viewfinder. It's kind of the same way that Charlie uh, professes in his class about using a card, right. and, you know, the card and moving it back and forth. But the Viewfinder app allows you to put in the lenses you have and then puts frames around based upon the, the lens you're using on the iPhone and allows you to get a preview of things and take pictures of it. And it marks uh, wow, where sweet. that picture is done. And then you can kind of go back and look at them and then go back with the big camera and set it up sure. and you know do the, the contemplative work. And I'm not a very good contemplative photographer, mind you. Remember, and part of the reason when I say I look upside down around at all is because you know I hang around, out around with somebody like Art Wolf a lot, who's not only a fine photographer, but you know he finds the photograph you know at your feet and behind you and everywhere else. And, you know, it's um, kind of that always be seen kind of things. And so, you know, I'm really wrestling with that kind of photography these days and what I'm doing with uh, the phase one system where, you know, I kind of slow down and contemplate um, what I'm taking. And it's funny during this pandemic, I've learned all sorts of new things like ICM photography and LE. So are you an LE photographer? LE, um, I use a, a Sony A7 or oh, LEs, long exposure. Long exposure, yeah. <laughs> I'm finding now that as I'm shooting and trying to think in, uh, of all these things, and particularly 
you know, the subject that I'm shooting, it's kind of fun to play with all these kind of abilities and things that you get trained for. But, you know, you seem to incorporate, you know, this, this contemplative photography and you also do a little bit of long exposure photography, don't you? Yes. Um, how long? Maybe the last six years. I've started experimenting with it. And um, whenever I'm around water, um, to me, it just goes hand in hand with water because water moves. Uh, seeing water as a static image just looks like a snapshot to me. And um, when long exposure is introduced, that water takes just uh, on an ethereal dreamy effect that just you know pulls me in and wraps itself around me. Um, beyond water, there are times that I'll be shooting something totally static like a hoodoo, but I still use long exposure uh, because I like to see movement in the sky. So again, that gives kind of an ethereal feel to what otherwise, what might otherwise be, you know, just a very straightforward uh, photo of a landscape or, like I mentioned, a hoodoo. I don't, I don't like to sound like a commercial, but you know, with this phase one system I'm using, they have a um, uh, a tool in there called frame averaging, and you basically set your exposure. Let's say it's one twenty fifth at ISO one hundred at f eleven. And then you can go into this thing called frame averaging and say, I, I want uh, three minutes, or if I'm photographing a waterfall, I want uh, you know a quarter of a second. Or um, the other day I photographed the city street and I used a seven minute exposure. And I you don't have to that. use a neutral density filter. So it takes shot after shot after shot and then puts them all together in, um, inside the camera and delivers an image. So like if you want intentional sky movement, I've been, and I have, I'll have an article coming up on the site uh, real soon on this. Um, but I shot this brand new hotel downtown with the camera and there's clouds going through. And, you know, I was playing with, you know, 15, 20 and 30 yeah. second ex, uh, exposures and just the, the, the clouds going through. And for a landscape photographer to have that tool without having to put a neutral density filter on. I mean, I, I looked at my images and I, God, these look it's like some of the jam did. <laughs> so, well, another uh, thing cool about that is that if there are people walking around, um, they disappear. They disappear. Right. Yeah, I, and I remember early on in Photoshop uh, Extended, this was going back maybe 10 years ago. In the extended version, they had a capability of taking any number of shots. Say you're at the Eiffel Tower and you want to show the Eiffel Tower without any people, which is impossible. You could just take a slew of photographs and it would only retain the parts that didn't change. So in a sense, you know, the, the people would disappear. I remember when I did that, I would do like war memorials and places like that where there's always people and, you know, or if you needed an empty street or something. And that's what I did the other day downtown in Indy was I did an empty street. Um, so my next assignment is to try to find an overpass and there's just been too much snow lately, but with it melting quickly, maybe in the next day or so, I'll get to an overpass and show one of the busiest highways with no cars on it kind of, you know, and have that ability. So it's, it, it is very cool. And uh, especially when you do water and other things like that. So, uh, and, but it's nice to have it where you don't have to have a, uh, you know, a neutral density filter on and everything uh, it, that the camera handles it itself. But, you know, of course, with a tool like a phase one camera, you pay the price, you know, which is, you know, they're not cheap, but if, you know, you're really dedicated and you want the finest, it's really a magnificent camera, especially for the contemplative photographer. So, um, you live where? I live in Northwest Ohio. And in the flatlands of Northwest Ohio, which is mind numbing to a landscape photographer. Uh, fortunately, we live adjacent to a nature preserve, so that really helps. I look out of my studio window right here and uh, I, I look at nature. So that makes it bearable. And fortunately, uh, we're not too far from Lake Superior, which is probably my favorite place to spend time. Uh, I can be there easily in a day. Um, the West, I love, as you know, but it's it's a bit further. I mean, you can fly there and it doesn't take much time, but I like to travel uh, with um, our camper. So it seems like it's just an endless trek across the Midwest, getting through Indiana and Illinois and oh. Oklahoma and Kansas. Oh my God, it just, it, it it's, it, it's just difficult for me to deal with that. 
Well, you know, I'm actually enjoy those those drives. I'm in Indiana, so I'm not much different than you when it comes to like, oh my God, what the hell did I move here for? Other than that, I, uh, I have affordable housing. Um, <laughs> I live in a great city. I got no complaints. Um, I really do love the area, but if you're a photographer, um, it might not be your your cup of tea. Although we, you know, there are in the Southern Indiana hills and and places to go that that are fun to photograph, but. You know, so you started out spending a lot of time along Lake Superior, and you become almost uh, an expert at you know the, the secret spots of Lake Superior. Well, that sounds really sexy. It secret does. Well, I thought I'd press it up Superior. for you. <laughs> I should make a book. <laughs> the secret, secret spots, spots of Lake, Lake Superior. Superior. <laughs> well, you never know. Maybe you got something going on there. So you know, you're you're you've been very good there. And then then you've traveled out uh, out west, as you mentioned. And you have a really cool camper set up. So, you know, you, you, you tow a kind of a small little, what, what do you call those kind of campers? Or uh, a teardrop camper. It's made by a company called New Camp. Um, we have the Tab 400. And as I was telling you uh, earlier, it would be nice to have a smaller version. They, there, there's so many small campers um, on the market these days that you can just pull behind most anything and get yourself anywhere that you want to go and that's just been a really uh, a big thing with me lately is getting off the, uh, the paved roads and going across um, the land so I just really connect with that because I, I just get tired of dealing with with people and um, commercialism so it just feels really good to get out off the highways and spend time in this pandemic, though, recently you were out west, where to Utah, if I remember correctly, and I just remember. Yes, uh, northern uh, New Mexico and southern Utah. Yes, I just remember the photographs you were putting up on uh, social media, and that's the cool part about social media, Facebook, and everything is you can kind of let people know where you are. But right. you know, you're going up a road barely wide enough for a car, and you're shooting out the the window. And you know you can't see the bottom. <laughs> so, that video, yes, that was a, a crazy video, and people were asking why the hell I put that up. But um, I mean, shy of having a GoPro, uh, I just held the camera out, and I mean, I think I've been driving cars for you know fifty years, so it, it wasn't that big a deal. But um, yeah, there were some crazy hairy um, curves on. I mean, more than curves, just switchbacks where you couldn't begin to see around the curve at all. So if someone was coming, I was thinking about that a month or so ago. What would you do if you're right on that curve? I mean, I, there's no, you just can't back up or go forward. I remember Charlie Kramer saying that, um, I forget his, his, his term or what he said, I, I, something like scare shitless, you know, when yeah, well. he, he saw that, <laughs> that coming. So, uh, I'm glad it was going up and not coming down because if your brakes fail, it was it would be all over. You weren't dragging your trailer, were you? No, oh no, I, it would be. Yeah. You, couldn't, you couldn't. No, that was just so, in the truck um, going. That was basically the Capitol Reef area um, for I don't know half a day spent just tra traversing the yeah. land around Capitol Reef. Which so is one you of my leave your you leave your camper at the uh, campsite and you yeah you just go or out you just on BLM land yes. Um, what kind of truck are you using? Uh, my Nissan. So you have Nissan, a Nissan uh, Titan or? or? No, I don't have the Titan. My uh, nephew has that. I have the smaller version, the uh, Frontier four wheel drive 4X Pro. So mm -hmm. nice little truck and it pulls the camper fine. I got I got a Gladiator before the uh, pandemic started. And even though I've taken it down to North Carolina, South Carolina, and Florida, I haven't really done the trips out west with it yet. So. Um, they're coming soon. Only two more weeks to my next shot, the second shot. And then One more week. Like, well, you know, I might have to go somewhere. <laughs> so, well, you know, this, uh, this, this trip um, was different than prior trips because typically I go after tourist season in the fall just to avoid tourists. Uh, I like to experience the wilderness as wilderness. This time, there were, it seemed like there were people and lots of people. Uh, pulling into Moab was crazy. And the back, traffic was backed up for like an hour just to get into Moab. So I got the hell out of there as fast as I could. Um, and fortunately found a campsite along the Colorado River. There was one left. Um, but like I said, I like to, to camp on BLM land much of the time. But 
the, the weather was crazy too. There were a couple of days of, of wind that just blew sand. Um, it, it was like dust storm. It felt like it was the, the dust bowl. And then a couple of nights of temp got down to seven degrees. So um, obviously I had to winterize the um, camper and I, I just hope that the, um, the heating system in, in the um, camper uh, would do it the job. And it, it did, it kept it like 65 degrees. So that's not bad. It's uh, a circulating, circulating uh, glycol system. So it's not forced air at all. It's just radiant heat and you don't see any of the heaters. They're behind cabinets and under benches and things. So it's, it's a wonderful system, a great camper. Good. Well, at least you had a good adventure. And, you know, it, it is, I think, during the pandemic, I've read that everybody's just taken to the road. You know, the RV business and trailer business, which was dying a few years ago, is a friend here in um, our hometown sold his house and is just living on the road now, spending time in the West. So he's having a great time. Pluses and minuses to it, but that's pretty cool. I mean, I'd much rather know I have a house to come home to. Same here. But, uh, uh, I house. You know, I got no problem with with camping and things, and most likely we'll move in that direction in the next year or so, depending on how the things go. You know, I've also run workshops all over the world too. Now you're running a workshop. I just you give a quick mention about the workshop. It'll be in the article. We're also publishing the second article uh, that Jan did, so uh, be sure it'll be linked as in in this article, so you can always find you know that article. But um, there's a PDF, and we'll put the PDF link in this article also about a workshop that you're gonna be doing, correct? Right. Um, this may be an appropriate time to mention that I was diagnosed with cancer. I mean, you know this um, diagnosis in the fall of 2017 and the year um, from 2017 to 2018 was hell. I mean, 140 rounds of chemo, um, radiation, um, numerous tests, un ongoing tests, uh, some surgery in the back, the type of cancer I uh, have um, we, robs the bones of calcium early on in the diagnosis until it's brought under control. And because of that, I lost five inches in height, uh, vertebrae just collapsing. Not the discs, but the vertebrae themselves. Uh, the bone just becomes weak. So I couldn't walk uh, unassisted for about eight months. Uh, I couldn't lay in a bed. I had to sleep in a chair. So it, it was hell. And because of that, I reevaluated my life um, and tried to decide what was important to me. Um, and I had two big goals that quickly moved to the top of the list. One was to do a workshop. I've taken workshops and I taught in a roundabout way um, in my position at PBS because I had college students working with me on a daily basis. So uh, doing a workshop, producing a hardcover book, were the, the, the two top um, priorities. So I did the workshop in the fall of 19. I was hoping to do it again last year. Wasn't able to do that because the border was closed uh, into Canada and the workshop is on the Eastern shores of Lake Superior, uh, which is my favorite area. So um, it's going to happen this fall as long as the border's open. So fingers crossed. I think we're heading in that direction. So. Uh, we do have the PDF, like I said, that'll explain what the workshop is. And if you're interested, uh, certainly check it out. I think spending any time with Jan out shooting would be a pleasure. I actually want to get out there and shoot with you, Jan. So, sweet. Because you know, it's it's one of the things that I've I've had the privilege of photographing with so many well-known photographers over the years. And you know, part of it is the pictures and learning how each other works and sees. But you know, it's just like golf. You know, there's uh, there's a lot of photography talk and adventures and you learn a lot about the the, the friends that you're with so um you know in, in the workshops that i do you see that all the time and uh, it's one of the most enjoyable things part of part of what i enjoy the most about doing the workshops is i usually take people back to places i've been before but they've never been there so the exactly. joy comes from watching them yeah. see the things that brought amazement to me the first time so Yes. You know, that part of sharing kind of what we do at PXL here, all that is so important to me. You know, it's um, photography has been so good to me in my career that if I can share it with other people and people can learn the joy and see differently and, you know, find their own style out of that, uh, it means means the world. You took the words out of my mouth. I was going to say, uh, sorry. About that. No, no, that's okay. Uh, then I don't have to say them. But um, 
to not share it's like you know we all of us uh, only live so long and if you don't share you know whatever you learn is gone so it's just nice to pass it along and help other people out and uh, i really enjoy doing that but Let, let's talk a minute about uh, as we, we we come to the end of this this past paced interview you've got an interesting project going on now it's a book correct maybe you can correct. tell us a little bit about your book project and how you can get some people involved in it, what you need, and your your concept for making it uh, get the getting it published and stuff. Well, I'm patterning patterning my book um, after some of John Sexton's books in that um, the quality is second to none. When I look at the um, prints in those books, I almost feel like I'm looking at his darkroom prints. So I've talked to John off and on through this uh, the past four years and gained some insight. Unfortunately, the printer that he's used um, um, is now out of business. They were based in LA and they've sold off their equipment as have many uh, high-end print shops in the US. So I've been in introduced to a couple others um, who are very close in quality to the company that he used. Uh, I spent the last three years writing and assembling uh, material that I wanted to include in the book. I talked with several um, uh, colleagues. Uh, you were one of them. Art Wolf is another, uh, Charlie Kramer, and several others to ask uh, if they'd be willing to um, uh, write some copy for the book. And all were most gracious in sharing information and their assessment of my work. So the, that copy will introduce to different sections of the book. It will be all black and white, um, 12 inches by 12 inches, at least 144 pages. And I need probably in the neighborhood of $12,000 or maybe a little more to make this happen. So I have put together um, what I refer to as the book project packets um, that I've mailed out to people. Um, response has been good. The packet includes a cover, included a cover letter, uh, an explanation of the project, uh, a CV, a six page CV of uh, my 20 year career. And I had a sample book printed, a 24 page sample book. So people will get an idea of what the finished um, book would look like. The sample book was printed on a digital press. So obviously the quality is not going to uh, compare to a final I'm printing on high end offset presses. But uh, that's been a lot of work and it's been rewarding. And um, I'm anxious to move forward with the final book and have it and printed by the end of summer. That's my goal. Well, having worked in PBS, public broadcasting, uh, for 30 years, uh, I know about fundraising now that they, you know, are constantly asking uh, people to uh, support the, uh, the broadcasting on, on, on public television. So um, Kickstarter would have been okay, but uh, I needed larger amounts of money. So I just, I wanted to do it this way. It was just a personal thing. It seems more professional to me and I'm totally in charge of it and I can show a sample of the work. So I'm um, just really proud of what I have put together. And uh, like I said, if you're interested in seeing um, a packet, let me know. If you're interested in supporting the project, also let me know. But going back to why black and white, uh, I'm often asked that photo, and I guess on an emotional level, I feel the black and white d disconnects the viewer from what they are accustomed to, to seeing. Um, black and white images are no longer simply a snapshot of the world. They become an abstraction of it, uh, which I feel changes their interpretation of them. So um, I, I guess that's kind of in a nutshell how I feel. Um, n nothing against color, but um, it seems like the black and white black and white fits my um my manners inner whatever yeah, I, or well, not only but, does it does it fit your your but you're 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 handling of printing the black and white is truly um exceptional the way you handle you. the scales um as you look at uh, jan's work you know you're going to look at a print and you know you're going to kind of go up to it and you're going to explore a lot of the shadow areas and the darker areas which there's just to find that you know kind of like a small amount of detail but it's enough to grab you and pull you in um it's all the things that 
you know, I truly believe in, in doing a good print, you know, not letting the highlights go out, but, you know, being able to still keep the details in the shadow that your eye is drawn to it and wants to see what's there. And so you spend time looking at the picture and uh, all Jan's pictures beg you to spend time looking at them. I think that's why you probably enjoy having uh, his book of photographs is that, you know, you can uh, pick up a glass of wine and sit down and, you know, slowly go through the images and explore each one of them and, you know, see and hear and feel, you know, the tale, especially what, you know, Jan did when, when he was shooting them. Okay, let me ask you a question, though. As you shoot your work, are you thinking about how you're going to be processing it? You know, that's a question that's been asked of photographers for a long, long time. Um, I know Ansel Adams was asked, you know, not asked, he, he said that he could visualize the black and white print when he was photographing. And to me, it's, it's not just that, it's visualizing how the entire composition will work. Uh, if it's a, a long exposure, I, I'm thinking about, you know, how I'll render it. Um, so, you know, I guess I'm more into the moment. It, it's like capturing the photo. And I know that when I get back, well, here, uh, that I can handle the processing of it. And something I've only recently started um, admitting to or revealing, whatever the, the terminology is, is that I do anything that I need to, to make the final piece, the final image be what I want it to be. So if there's a sky there that I don't care for, it's gone. If uh, things are in the wrong place, they're gone. If I don't like exactly the way a rock is curving, I, I can easily change that. So um, I feel like I, I've been dealing with Photoshop since its introduction in 1990. I've been with it. I've taken a lot of Photoshop classes with the, uh, the two lead Photoshop people at Adobe. So I know the program really well. And that's why I only use Photoshop. I don't even use Lightroom. So I think I'm the only guy on the planet that only uses Photoshop, but it works for me and it works for me really well. I do a lot of masking that allow me to do a lot of other things such as tonal adjustments. Um, but um, like I say, I, I, have, I give myself full freedom to do whatever I want to do to make that print be what I want it to be. How many iterations do you normally go to um, through as you make your print? I know, you know, especially if you're a Charlie Kramer disciple, that's going to be at least three or four. Oh, yeah. I mean, right here, I'm looking at my uh, desktop and I can see that there are certain images that have like five. I mean, I, I, don't, I really try and keep it down to a couple and some, you know, I just I, I work only one, but there are times that I'll come, I often come back to photos, you know, months later, I have a, a folder on my desktop called in progress, photos hyphen in progress. Yep. And getting the book together forced me to go through those. And it took a good week to go through because I had a lot of images in there that I had like this close to being done, but I just wasn't satisfied with them. So it was a make or break moment. It's either do it or, you know, they won't make it into the book. I've changed too. I mean, uh, I'm, uh, the way I render things comes more naturally than what it did even 10, even five years ago. Uh, I looked at some of these images and I thought, whoa, you know, I only got it this far. And I took that final step um, within the past month. But that's experience and time and part of what I call a 10,000 hour rule. You know, the more you do it and the more time you spend at it, the, sure. the more it gets to that point where, you know, you get three quarters of the way through what used to take 10 tries, you know, on your first try now, because you know how it works and what to, to expect. So a few other quick questions, um, because the readers are going to want to know. Um, so while we're talking about printing, what paper are you printing with? I'm Museo Silver Rag. I was introduced to that many, many years ago. And I remember the first time I printed on it, I was blown away by the DMAX. It's like, wow. And I, I like the, the look, the feel, the texture of it, the slight sheen. It really takes me back to dark green papers of yesteryear. And I've had people look at my work and, and they, they feel that it's a, dark, a darkroom print as opposed to um, a print that's you know, produced on a machine. So that's um, 
a good feeling when I hear that. So only Museo Silver Egg. I know a lot of people use a lot of different papers, but um, I just used that particular one. And I've had a lot of problems with it through the years. The company has a difficult time getting good, good product from mills. A lot of the mills have closed in the United States. So it, it's a real hassle for them, but they've always stood behind me and uh, made things right. So you know, the, pa the paper them. industry, there's a whole untold story about what's happened in the paper industry in the last couple of years. But uh, we'll, we'll, have, we'll cover that on another, another topic. As far as hardware goes, what are the cameras you're shooting with and your favorite lens? I use the 24 tilt shift um, some, uh, 2470 a, a lot. I like to be able to um, um, use the, the zooming capabilities to, um, for, again, for all for composition. I have other lenses, longer lenses, uh, wider angle lenses, but because of my back, um, I've just pretty much left them behind. I mean, I carry them with me. So if there's a specific occasion where I find something that I might need a longer lens, I could go back to the uh, camper and shoot it another day. So um, the Canon uh, digital equipment is what I'm using. Mirrorless or Again, DSLR? I haven't gone mirrorless. No, the last um, iteration was the 5D Mark IV. And that's where I'm at now. Um, I'm happy with it. Uh, if mirrorless allowed me to save a lot of weight, uh, I would I jump on it. But um, if I've been told if that's really the only reason that I would make a switch, then probably don't do it because I'm only going to save a few ounces. So um, yeah, that's where I'm at. Um, an Epson 7000 uh, printer allows me to go on uh, 24 inches wide and um, really right stuff, uh, tripod, ball head, and um, Stingray filters, and a Haida Hi um, filter holder. I've been using Lee and just recently switched. And Stingray tells me that they're going to be producing their own filter holders. So I may be looking into that once that comes about. So I think that about wraps up the equipment. Like I told you, I'm very um, low as far as tech. It, it, to me, it, it's just, it's about the, the art um, and the tech allows me to get to that point. And I know a lot of people really never make prints anymore, but to me, um, uh, that's as, sad. As said, um, yeah, the, the negative is the score and the print is the performance. So, you know, I'm all about the prints and, you know, being an old time photographer doing this for 50 plus years. Uh, I really don't believe you have a photograph until you can hold it in your hand. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the swiping of, of social media and, you know, easy to see prints and show where you are and so forth. That's great. But, you know, until you can hold a print in your hands, you don't have it. I make eight and a half by 11 prints like they're coming out of the, the woodwork. They sit in big boxes on, on, in my living room and family room. And, you know, if people come over and they want to pick them out and pass them around, you know, you can't pass an iPad around or an iPhone around. It's a kind of an individual kind of basis. And while I think it's great to have my portfolio on my iPad, because I can go into a gallery and show them my work, it doesn't substitute for holding the print. And so, you know, at home here, I'm constantly making prints all the time. Uh, the Epson P700 and the Epson print layout make it so simple to do even for mobile devices. And then at the gallery, I've got four printers, a 9900, a P900, uh, Canon 4000, and a Canon 1000. And, uh, you know, I'm constantly making prints for exhibits and other things down there. But the, the print is very, very important to me. You know, if I die tomorrow, I leave behind a lot of prints. Don't forget to sign them. I'm always telling everybody, sign your prints. Even if they're proof prints, sign them so that they're worth something for your family when you go. Um, so those are just, you know, my tidbits. I've been dealing with uh, Jack Coran's um, son because you can ever going to do a trade. I do a lot of trades uh, up on the wall here. I have an Alan Rob, um, which is, is just a recent um, trade. So that's awesome. And um, I'm over on the printer, um, Jeff K. Dash. He had a show at the Detroit Institute of Art that was incredible. They gave him the entire photography gallery and um, he does some superb work, uh, a Detroit native. So, um, yeah, I mean, you can't trade photos unless you make prints. So right. that's another reason 
to uh, make those paper prints. Well, look, you know, we could sit here all day and 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 talk, but uh, we're fortunate enough to have this video, which you know we are dropping photographs in on top and different things along the way, and of course the article that you've written in the. I really stress to the people that are interested, um, talk to Jan about his book project. You know, if you're interested in an interesting, fun, different kind of workshop, um, you can download the PDF and get in touch with Jan about that too. Jan, as always, it's a great pleasure to, to talk to you and uh, communicate with you and stay in touch with you. Um, I feel privileged that I have you and so many other people as photographer friends that we can you know, shoot the breeze, just like we were even before we started this recording and, you know, whatnot. But, you know, we've, we've had a heck of a year, you know, a lot of us staying inside, not traveling to where we want to go. I'm restless as hell. I just want to get out and shoot. I know a lot of other people do. I get my workshop business back together so I can take people to some of those most interesting places, you know, to take those kind of photographs. But, um, you know, I think photography is the great friend maker. If everybody in the world would just take pictures and we get all this political stuff behind us, um, you know, it's a great equalizer. And it's something that, you know, comes from your heart, your eyes and your mind. And it just, it just works. Um, you know, it's the nice thing about workshops when you bring people in from different countries that we might have differences with sometimes. Never find any differences on the workshops when you're standing there taking pictures. There is a, a real camaraderie um, and a sharing that, that's just in, that's incredible. For me, one of the best parts of a workshop are critiques, and it goes back to my training is in, in art school. We would have you know critiques all the time, so that is a big part of of my workshop. And Charlie Kramer did those too. Um, we showed work, so I remember saying, "I'll be the first person." Everyone was <laughs> quiet. Like I'll show my work. Yeah, so. Yeah. Yeah, sometimes you have to have thick skin, but that's the way you learn, you know. Um, if somebody's a good critiquer, you know, if you're a good photographer, great. If you think you're a good photographer and you get a good critique, um, you know, listen to what's being said and be, you know, man enough to say, you know what, I hear you. I understand. I see it now. Well, you know, something I noticed on social media, it, it's just, it, 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 there's so many likes, you know. I like this. I love this. This is great. This is beautiful. And... No one does wonderful work 100% of the time. And there are certain people I notice that just, it, it's constant, you know. It, it's, you know, uh, the big pat on the shoulder. It's like, that's not, that doesn't help you grow, in my opinion. Critiques should gently say, you know, you might do this, you might try that, or you need to work on this. Just not to say, you know, oh, that's wonderful. You know, on the P, on the photo PXL forms, we have people that post their images, and you know, you will get responses like, "Oh, you know, it's too contrasty," or maybe you should crop it, or you know, it's really a lovely picture. And you know, sometimes you're you, you're dead nuts on, and sometimes, you know, you they, the 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 poster goes back and listens to what's said and tries out a couple new things, and you know, finds that the image actually, you know, with some of these suggestions, makes sense. Yeah. So you got to just have an open mind and and be able to do it. Art Wolf and I, when we sit in the same room together we bust on each other's images and you know uh, I, I've learned so much from uh, from being with him and doing that um, of course you'll probably never admit that he learned a lot from me but <laughs> the point is you know it, it, it's part of what's there you you'll you see things you, you there's a number of ways it can be seen there's a number of ways it can be handled in the end either color or black and white it makes a big difference and um you know, I've, having talked to you about your photographs and, uh, you know, seeing them up close, you know, I know you've got to be a wonderful teacher and probably a, a great instructor along those lines. And especially if you've hung around with Charlie Kramer and all those guys. Anyway, everybody, I'd like to say thanks for uh, being part of this, hanging in there. Uh, you can certainly find uh, Jan's website in the, the, the article and the, the links will be all there. Please uh, take a visit to his site, take a look at his work. Um, consider helping him with his book project. And uh, well, maybe you guys will all meet out there somewhere on the road. So you know, I think it's uh, been really great, uh, really great, Janet, to spend the time with me this afternoon. It, it, it means a lot. And I know the readers are going to enjoy it too. I just looked up at my image and it looks like I have a pink face. The, the tones reflecting off of this monitor are really bringing out, I'm really not like, you know, pig pink. So, um, 
I just I throw that in as a final comment here. He's not pink. He's he's normal, <laughs> but yes. it's it's part of the Zoom culture these days, you know, and that's just what it is. So anyway, uh, once it's been again, good talking you. with you, Kevin. Thank you. Thanks for being part of the family here, where we're working really hard to enhance your vision every day, and uh, really appreciate the support. Uh, we're growing, and it's getting to be a real fun time. And uh, you know, it's all about the photography. So stay tuned. We have a lot more to come. And once again, Jan, thanks. Take care. Be safe. Stay healthy, buddy.